Part Two of A Grammar of the English Tongue by Samuel Johnson. Read for the LibriVox Language Learning Collection, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Part Two of A Grammar of the English Tongue by Samuel Johnson. Of Nouns Substantive. The relations of English nouns to words going before or following are not expressed by cases or changes of termination, but as in most of the other European languages by prepositions, unless we may be said to have a genitive case. Singular. Nominative. Magister, a master, the master. Genitive, magistry, of a master, of the master, or masters, the masters. Dative, magistro, to a master, to the master. Accusative, magistrum, a master, the master. Vocative, magister, master, o master. Ablative, Magistro, from a master, from the master. Plural. Nominative, magistry, masters, the masters. Genitive, magistrorum, of masters, of the masters. Dative, magistris, to masters, to the masters. Accusative, magistros, masters, the masters. Vocative, Magistry, Masters, O Masters. Ablative, Magistress, from Masters, from the Masters. Our nouns are therefore only declined thus. Master, Genitive, Masters, Plural, Masters. Scholar, Genitive, Scholars, Plural, Scholars. These genitives are always written with a mark of elision. M a s t e r apostrophe s s c h o l a r apostrophe s, according to an opinion long received, that the apostrophe s is a contraction of his as the soldier's valor, for the soldier his valor, but this cannot be the true original because apostrophe s is put to female nouns. Woman's beauty, the virgin's delicacy. Haughty Juno's unrelenting hate, and collective nouns as women's passions, the rabble's insolence, the multitude's folly. In all these cases, it is apparent that his cannot be understood. We say likewise the foundation's strength, the diamond's lustre, the winter's severity. But in these cases, his may be understood he and his having formerly been applied to neuters in the place now supplied by it and its. The learned and sagacious Wallace, to whom every English grammarian owes a tribute of reverence, calls this modification of the noun an adjective possessive. I think with no more propriety than he might have applied the same to the genitive in equitum desus, trohe oris or any other Latin genitive. Dr. Louth, on the other part, supposes the possessive pronouns mine and thine to be genitive cases. This termination of the noun seems to constitute a real genitive indicating possession. It is derived to us from the Saxons, who declined smith a smith, genitive smither of a smith, plural smither or smithar, smiths and so in two other of their seven declensions. It is a further confirmation of this opinion that in the old poets both the genitive and plural were longer by a syllable than the original word, K-N-I-T-I-S for knights, in Chaucer, L-E-A-V-I-S for leaves, in Spencer. When a word ends in S, the genitive may be the same with the nominative as Venus Temple, 
The plural is formed by adding s, as table, tables, fly, flies, sister, sisters, wood, woods, or es where s could not otherwise be sounded, as after ch, s, sh, x, z. After c sounded like s and g like j. The mute e is vocal before s, as lance, lances, outrage, outrages. The formation of the plural and genitive singular is the same. A few words still make the plural in n, as men, women, oxen, swine, and more anciently, ion, shun. This formation is that which generally prevails in the Teutonic dialects. Words that end in f commonly form their plural by ves, as loaf, loaves, calf, calves. Except a few, muff, muffs, chief, chiefs, so hoof, roof, proof, relief, mischief, puff, cuff, dwarf, handkerchief, grief. Irregular plurals are teeth from tooth, lice from louse, mice from mouse, geese from goose, feet from foot, dice from die, pence from penny, brethren from brother, children from child. Plurals ending in s have no genitives, but we say women's excellencies, and weigh the men's wits against the ladies' hairs. Dr. Willis thinks the Lord's house may be said for the house of lords, but such phrases are not now in use, and surely an English ear rebels against them. They would commonly produce a troublesome ambiguity, as the Lord's house may be the house of lords, or the house of a lord. Besides that, the mark of elision is improper, for in the Lord's house nothing is cut off. Some English substantives, like those of many other languages, change their termination as they express different sexes, as prince, princess, actor, actress, lion, lioness, hero, heroine. To these mentioned by Dr. Louth may be added arbitress, poetess, chantress, duchess, tigress, governess, tutress, peeress, authoress, traitress, and perhaps others. Of these variable terminations we have only a sufficient number to make us feel our want, for when we say of a woman that she is a philosopher, an astronomer, a builder, a weaver, a dancer, we perceive an impropriety in the termination which we cannot avoid. But we can say that she is an architect, a botanist, a student, because these terminations have not annexed to them the notion of sex. In words which the necessities of life are often requiring, the sex is distinguished not by different terminations, but by different names, as a bull, a cow, a horse, a mare, equus, equa, a cock, a hen, and sometimes by pronouns prefixed, as a he-goat a she-goat. Of adjectives. Adjectives in the English language are wholly indeclinable, having neither case, gender, nor number, and being added to substantives in all relations without any change, as a good woman, good women, of a good woman, a good man, good men, of good men. The Comparison of Adjectives. The comparative degree of adjectives is formed by adding er, the superlative by adding est to the positive, as fair, fairer, fairest, lovely, lovelier, loveliest, sweet, sweeter, sweetest, low, lower, lowest, high, higher, highest. Some words are irregularly compared, as good, better, best, bad, worse, worst, little, less, least near, nearer, next, much, more, most, many for moe, more for moer, most for moest, late, later, latest, or last. Some comparatives form a superlative by adding most as nether, nethermost, outer, outermost, under, undermost, up, upper, uppermost, for, former, 
foremost. Most is sometimes added to a substantive, as topmost, southmost. Many adjectives do not admit of comparison by terminations, and are only compared by more and most, as benevolent, more benevolent, most benevolent. All adjectives may be compared by more and most, even when they have comparatives and superlatives regularly formed, as fair, fairer, or more fair, fairest or most fair. In adjectives that admit a regular comparison, the comparative more is oftener used than the superlative most, as more fair is oftener written for fairer than most fair for fairest. The comparison of adjectives is very uncertain, and being much regulated by commodiousness of utterance, or agreeableness of sound, is not easily reduced to rules. Monosyllables are commonly compared. Polysyllables, or words of more than two syllables, are seldom compared otherwise than by more and most, as deplorable more deplorable most deplorable. Dissyllables are seldom compared if they terminate in SOME, as fulsome, toilsome, in FUL, as careful, spleenful, dreadful, in ING, as trifling, charming, in OUS, as porous, in LESS, as careless, harmless, in ED, as wretched, in ID, as candid, in AL, as mortal, in ENT, as recent, fervent, in AIN as certain, in IVE as missive, in DY as woody, in FY as puffy, in KY as rocky, except lucky, in MY as roomy, in NY as skinny, in PY as ropey, except happy, in RY as hoary. Some comparatives and superlatives are yet found in good writers formed without regard to the foregoing rules. But in a language subjected so little and so lately to grammar, such anomalies must frequently occur. So shady is compared by Milton. She in shadiest covert hid, tuned her nocturnal note. Paradise Lost. And virtuous. What she wills to say or do seems wisest, virtuousest, discreetest, best. Paradise Lost. So trifling by Ray, who is indeed of no great authority. It is not so decorous, in respect of God, that he should immediately do all the meanest and triflingest things himself, without making use of any inferior or subordinate minister. Ray on the Creation. Famous by Milton. I shall be named among the famousest of women, sung at solemn festivals. Milton's Agonistes. Inventive by Asham. Those have the inventivest heads for all purposes, and roundest tongues in all matters. Asham's Schoolmaster. Mortal by Bacon. The mortalest poisons practised by the West Indians have some mixture of the blood, fat, or flesh of man. Bacon. Natural by Watton. I will now deliver a few of the properest and naturalest considerations that belong to this piece. Watton's Architecture. Wretched by Johnson. The wretcheder are the contemners of all helps such as presuming on their own naturals, deride diligence, and mock at terms when they understand not things. Ben Jonson Powerful by Milton We have sustained one day in doubtful fight. What heaven's great king hath powerfulest to send against us from about his throne? Paradise Lost the termination in ish may be accounted in some sort a degree of comparison, by which the signification is diminished below the positive, as black, blackish, or tending to blackness, salt, saltish, or having a little taste of salt. They therefore admit no comparison. This termination is seldom added but to words expressing sensible qualities. 
nor often to words of above one syllable, and is scarcely used in the solemn or sublime style. Of Pronouns Pronouns in the English language are I, thou, he, with their plurals we, ye, they, it, who, which, what, whether, whosoever, whatsoever, my, mine, our, ours, thy, thine, your, yours, his, her, hers, theirs, this, that, other, another, the same, some. The pronouns personal are irregularly inflected. Singular nominative, I. Plural nominative, we. Accusative, and me, us, other oblique cases. Nominative, thou, ye. Oblique, thee, you. You is commonly used in modern writers for ye, particularly in the language of ceremony, where the second person plural is used for the second person singular. You are my friend. Singular nominative, he. Plural nominative, they, applied to masculines. Oblique, him, them. Nominative, she, they, applied to feminines. Oblique, her, them. Nominative, it, they, applied to neuters or things. Oblique, its, them. For it, the practice of ancient writers was to use he, and for its, his. The possessive pronouns, like other adjectives, are without cases or change of termination. The possessive of the first person is my, mine, our, ours. Of the second, thy, thine, your, yours. Of the third, from he, his, from she, her, and hers and in the plural, their, theirs, for both sexes. Ours, yours, hers, theirs, are used when the substantive preceding is separated by a verb, as these are our books, these books are ours. Your children excel ours in stature, but ours surpass yours in learning. Ours, yours, hers, theirs, notwithstanding their seeming plural termination, are applied equally to singular and plural substantives, as, this book is ours, these books are ours. Mine and thine were formerly used before a vowel, as mine amiable lady, which though now disused in prose, might be still properly continued in poetry. They are used as ours and yours when they are referred to a substantive preceding. As thy house is larger than mine, but my garden is more spacious than thine. Their and theirs are the possessives likewise of they, when they is the plural of it, and are therefore applied to things. Pronouns relative are who, which, what, whether, whosoever, whatsoever. Nominative, who, genitive, whose, other oblique cases, whom. Nominative, which, genitive, of which, or whose, other oblique cases, which. Who is now used in relation to persons, and which in relation to things? but they were anciently confounded. At least it was common to say, the man which, though I remember no example of the thing who. Whose is rather the poetical than regular genitive of which. The fruit of that forbidden tree, whose mortal taste brought death into the world. Milton. Whether is only used in the nominative and accusative cases, and has no plural being applied only to one of a number, commonly to one of two, 
as whether of these is left I know not. Whether shall I choose? It is now almost obsolete. What, whether relative or interrogative, is without variation? Whosoever, whatsoever, being compounded of who or what and soever, follow the rule of their primitives. Singular. This. Plural. These. In all cases, that, those. Other. Others. Whether. The plural others is not used but when it is referred to a substantive preceding, as I have sent other horses. I have not sent the same horses, but others. Another, being only an other, has no plural. Here, there, and where, joined with certain particles, have a relative and pronominal use. Hereof, herein, hereby, hereafter, herewith, thereof, therein, thereby, thereupon, therewith, whereof, wherein, whereby, whereupon, wherewith, which signify of this, in this, etc., of that, in that, etc., of which, in which, etc. Therefore and wherefore, which are properly T-H-E-R-E-F-O-R and W-H-E-R-E-F-O-R, for that, for which, are now reckoned conjunctions and continued in use. The rest seem to be passing by degrees into neglect, though proper, useful, and analogous. They are referred both to singular and plural antecedents. There are two more words used only in conjunction with pronouns, own and self. Own is added to possessives, both singular and plural, as my own hand, our own house. It is emphatical, and implies a silent contrariety or opposition, as, I live in my own house, that is, not in a hired house. This I did with my own hand, that is, without help or not by proxy. Self is added to possessives, as myself, yourselves. And sometimes to personal pronouns, as himself, itself, themselves. It then, like own, expresses emphasis and opposition, as I did this myself, that is, not another. Or it forms a reciprocal pronoun, as we hurt ourselves by vain rage. Himself, itself, themselves, are supposed by Wallace to be put by corruption, for his self, itself, their selves. So that self is always a substantive. This seems justly observed, for we say, he came himself. Himself shall do this, where himself cannot be an accusative. Of the verb. English verbs are active, as I love, or neuter, as I languish. The neuters are formed like the actives. Most verbs signifying action may likewise signify condition or habit, and become neuters, as I love, I am in love, I strike. I am now striking. Verbs have only two tenses inflected in their terminations, the present and simple preterite. The other tenses are compounded of the auxiliary verbs have, shall, will, let, may, can, and the infinitive of the active or neuter verb. The passive voice is formed by joining the participle preterite to the substantive verb, as I am loved to have, indicative mood, present tense, singular, I have, thou hast, he hath, or has, plural, we have, ye have, they have. Has is a termination connoted from hath, but now more frequently used both in verse and prose. Simple preterite, singular, I had, thou hadst, he had, Plural. We had, ye had, they had. Compound preterite. Singular. I have had, thou hast had, he has or hath had. 
plural. We have had, ye have had, they have had. Preterpluperfect. Singular. I had had, thou hadst had, he had had. Plural. We had had, ye had had, they had had. Future. Singular. I shall have, thou shalt have, he shall have. Plural. We shall have, ye shall have, they shall have. Second Future Singular I will have, thou wilt have, he will have. Plural We will have, ye wilt have, they will have. By reading these future tenses may be observed the variations of shall and will. Imperative Mood Singular have, or have thou, let him have. Plural. Let us have, have, or have ye, let them have. Conjunctive mood. Present. Singular. I have, thou have, he have. Plural. We have, ye have, they have. Preterite simple as in the indicative. Preterite compound. Singular. I have had. Thou have had. He have had. Plural. We have had. Ye have had. They have had. Future. Singular. I shall have as in the indicative. Second future. Singular. I shall have had. Thou shalt have had. He shall have had. Plural. We shall have had, ye shall have had, they shall have had. Potential The potential form of speaking is expressed by may, can, in the present, and might, could, or should, in the preterite, joined with the infinitive mood of the verb. Present Singular I may have, thou mayest have, he may have. Plural. We may have, ye may have, they may have. Preterite. Singular. I might have, thou mightst have, he might have. Plural. We might have, ye might have, they might have. Present. Singular. I can have, thou canst have, he can have. Plural. We can have, ye can have, they can have. Preterite. Singular. I could have, thou couldst have, he could have. Plural. We could have, ye could have, they could have. In like manner should is united to the verb. There is likewise a double preterite. Singular. I should have had, thou shouldst have had, he should have had. Plural. We should have had, ye should have had, they should have had. In like manner we use I might have had, I could have had, etc. Infinitive mood. Present. To have. Preterite. To have had. Participle present. Having. Participle preterite. Had. Verb active. To love. Indicative. Present. Singular. I love, thou lovest, he loveth, or loves. Plural. We love, ye love, they love. Preterite simple. Singular. I loved, thou lovest, he loved. Plural. We loved, ye loved, they loved. Preterperfect compound. I have loved, etc. Preterpluperfect. I had loved, etc. Future. I shall love, etc. I will love, etc. Imperative. Singular. Love or love thou, let him love. Plural. Let us love, love or love ye, let them love. 
Conjunctive, present, singular, I love, thou love, he love. Plural, we love, ye love, they love. Preterite simple, as in the indicative. Preterite compound, I have loved, etc. Future, I shall love, etc. Second future, I shall have loved, etc. Potential present i may or can love etc preterite i might could or should love etc double preterite i might could or should have loved etc infinitive present to love preterite to have loved participle present loving Participle past, loved. The passive is formed by the addition of the participle preterite to the different tenses of the verb to be, which must therefore be here exhibited. Indicative, present. Singular, I am, thou art, he is. Plural, we are or be, ye are or be, they are or be. The plural be is now little in use. Preterite Singular I was, thou wast, or wert, he was. Plural We were, ye were, they were. Wert is properly of the conjunctive mood, and ought not to be used in the indicative. Preterite compound I have been, etc. Preter pluperfect, I had been, etc. Future, I shall or will be, etc. Imperative, singular, be thou, let him be, plural, let us be, be ye, let them be. Conjunctive, present, singular, I be, Thou beest, he be. Plural. We be, ye be, they be. Preterite. Singular. I were, thou wert, he were. Plural. We were, ye were, they were. Preterite compound. I have been, etc. Future. I shall have been, etc. Potential. I may or can. Would, could, or should be. Could, would, or should have been, etc. Infinitive. Present. To be. Preterite. To have been. Participle present. Being. Participle preterite. Having been. Passive voice. Indicative mood. I am loved, etc. I was loved, etc. I have been loved, etc. Conjunctive mood. If I be loved, etc. If I were loved, etc. If I shall have been loved, etc. Potential mood. I may or can be loved, etc. I might, could, or should be loved, etc. I might, could, or should have been loved, etc. Infinitive Present To be loved Preterite To have been loved Participle Loved There is another form of English verbs in which the infinitive mood is joined to the verb do in its various inflections which are therefore to be learned in this place. To do. Indicative. Present. Singular. I do, thou dost, he doth. Plural. We do, ye do, they do. Preterite. Singular. I did, thou didst, he did. Plural. We did, ye did, they did. Preterite etc. 
I have done, etc. I had done, etc. Future. I shall or will do, etc. Imperative. Singular. Do thou. Let him do. Plural. Let us do. Do ye. Let them do. Conjunctive. Present. Singular. I do. Thou do. He do. Plural. We do. Ye do. They do. The rest are as in the indicative. Infinite. To do. To have done. Participle present. Doing. Participle preterite. Done. Do is sometimes used superfluously, as I do love, I did love, simply for I love, or I loved. But this is considered as a vicious mode of speech. It is sometimes used emphatically, as I do love thee, and when I love thee not, chaos is come again. Shakespeare. It is frequently joined with a negative, as I like her, but I do not love her. I wished him success, but did not help him. This, by custom at least, appears more easy than the other form of expressing the same sense by a negative adverb after the verb, I like her, but love her not. The imperative prohibitory is seldom applied in the second person, at least in prose, without the word do, as stop him, but do not hurt him. Praise beauty but do not dote on it. Its chief use is in interrogative forms of speech, in which it is used through all the persons, as, Do I live? Dost thou strike me? Do they rebel? Did I complain? Didst thou love her? Did she die? So likewise in negative interrogations. Do I not yet grieve? Did she not die? Do and did are thus used only for the present and simple preterite. There is another matter of conjugating neuter verbs, which, when it is used, may not improperly denominate them neuter passives, as they are inflected according to the passive form, by the help of the verb substantive, to be. They answer nearly to the reciprocal verbs in French, as I am risen, surexi, Latin. Je me suis levé, French. I was walked out, ex -hiram. Je me toi promené. In like manner, we commonly express the present tense as, I am going, eo. I am grieving, doleo. She is dying, illa moritur. The tempest is raging, ferret prosella. I am pursuing an enemy, hostum in sequor. So the other tenses, as we were walking, Greek, entin chanamen, peripatuntis. I have been walking, I had been walking, I shall or will be walking. There is another manner of using the active participle, which gives it a passive signification, as, the grammar is now printing, grammatica jam nunc chartis imprimatur. The brass is forging, ara excuduntur. This is, in my opinion, a vicious expression, probably corrupted from a phrase more pure, but now somewhat obsolete. The book is a printing, the brass is a forging, a being properly at, and printing and forging verbal nouns signifying action according to the analogy of this language. The indicative and conjunctive moods are by modern writers frequently confounded, or rather the conjunctive is wholly neglected, when some convenience of versification does not invite its revival. It is used among the purer writers of former times after if, though, ere, before, till, or until, whether, except, unless, whatsoever, whomsoever, and words of wishing, as doubtless thou art our father, though Abraham be ignorant of us, and Israel acknowledge us not. 
Of Irregular Verbs The English verbs were divided by Ben Johnson into four conjugations, without any reason arising from the nature of the language, which is properly but one conjugation, such as has been exemplified, from which all deviations are to be considered as anomalies, which are indeed in our monosyllable Saxon verbs, and the verbs derived from them very frequent. But almost all the verbs which have been adopted from other languages follow the regular form. Our verbs are observed by Dr. Wallace to be irregular only in the formation of the preterite and its participle. Indeed, in the scantiness of our conjugations, there is scarcely any other place for irregularity. The first irregularity is a slight deviation from the regular form, by rapid utterance or poetical contraction. The last syllable ed is often joined with the former by suppression of e, as lov apostrophe d for loved. After c, ch, sh, f, k, x, and after the consonants s, th, when more strongly pronounced, and sometimes after m, n, r, if preceded by a short vowel, t is used in pronunciation but very seldom in writing rather than d as p l a c apostrophe t s n a t c h apostrophe t f i s h apostrophe t w a k apostrophe t d w e l apostrophe t s m e l apostrophe t for p l a c apostrophe d s n a t c h apostrophe d F I S H apostrophe D W A K apostrophe D D W E L apostrophe D S M E L apostrophe D or P L A C E D S N A T C H E D F I S H E D W A K E D D W E L L E D S M E L L E D Those words which terminate in L or LL or P make their preterite in T, even in solemn language, as crept, felt, dwelt. Sometimes after X, ED is changed into T, as vexed. This is not constant. A long vowel is often changed into a short one, thus kept, slept, wept, crept, swept from the verbs to keep, to sleep, to weep, to creep, to sweep. Where D or T go before, the additional letter D or T, in this contracted form, coalesce into one letter with the radical D or T. If T were the radical, they coalesce into T, but if D were the radical, then into D or T, as the one or the other letter may be more easily pronounced. As read, led, spread, shed, shred, bid, hid, chid, fed, bled, bred, sped, strid, slid, rid. From the verbs to read, to lead, to spread, to shed, to shred, to bid, to hide, to chide, to feed, to bleed, to breed, to speed, to stride, to slide, to ride. And thus cast, hurt, cost, burst, eat, beat, sweat, sit, quit, smit, writ, bit, hit, met, shot. From the verbs to cast, to hurt, to cost, to burst, to eat, to beat, to sweat, to sit, to quit, to smite, to write, to bite, to hit, to meet, to shoot. And in like manner, lent, sent, rent, girt. From the verbs to lend, to send, to rend, to gird. The participle preterite or passive is often formed in en instead of ed, as ben, taken, given, slain, known, from the verbs to be, to take, to give, to slay, 
to know. Many words have two or more participles, as not only written, bitten, eaten, beaten, hidden, chidden, shotten, chosen, broken, but likewise writ, bit, eat, beat, hid, chid, shot, chose, broke, are promiscuously used in the participle, from the verbs to write, to bite, to eat, to beat, to hide, to chide, to shoot, to choose, to break, and many such like. In the same manner, sown, shoon, hewn, moan, loaden, laden, as well as sowed, showed, hewed, mowed, loaded, laded, from the verbs to sow, to show, to hew, to mow, to load, to laid. Concerning these double participles, it is difficult to give any rule. But he shall seldom err who remembers that when a verb has a participle distinct from its preterite, as right, wrote, written, that distinct participle is more proper and elegant as the book is written, is better than the book is wrote. Wrote, however, may be used in poetry, at least if we allow any authority to poets, who in the exultation of genius think themselves perhaps entitled to trample on grammarians. There are other anomalies in the preterite. 1. Win, spin, begin, swim, strike, stick, sing, sting, fling, ring, ring, spring, swing, drink, sink, shrink, stink, come, run, find, bind, grind, wind, both in the preterite imperfect and participle passive, give one, spun, begun, swum, struck, stuck, sung, stung, flung, rung, rung, sprung, swung, drunk, sunk, shrunk, stunk, come, run, found, bound, ground, wound. And most of them are also formed in the preterite by a, as began, sang, rang, sprang, drank, came, ran, and some others. But most of these are now obsolete. Some in the participle passive likewise take en, as stricken, strucken, drunken, bounden. 2. Fight, teach, reach, seek, beseech, catch, buy, bring, think, work, make, fought, taught, wrought, sought, besought, caught, bought, brought, thought, wrought. But a great many of these retain likewise the regular form, as teached, reached, beseeched, catched, worked. 3. Take, shake, forsake, wake, awake, stand, break, speak, bear, shear, swear, tear, wear, weave, cleave, strive, thrive, drive, shine, rise, arise, smite, write, bide, abide, ride, choose, choose, tread, get, beget, forget, seethe, Make in both preterite and participle took, shook, forsook, woke, awoke, stood, broke, spoke, bore, shore, swore, tore, wore, wove, clove, strove, throve, drove, shone, rose, arose, smote, wrote, bode, abode, rode, chose, trode, got, begot, forgot, sod. But we say likewise thrive, rise, smit, writ, abid, rid. In the preterite some are likewise formed by a, as break, spake, bear, share, swear, tear, wear, clave, gat, begat, forgat, and perhaps some others, but more rarely. 
In the participle passive many of them are formed by en as taken, shaken, forsaken, broken, spoken, born, shorn, sworn, torn, worn, woven, cloven, thriven, driven, r risen, smitten, ridden, chosen, trodden, gotten, begotten, forgotten, sodden. And many do likewise retain the analogy in both as waked, awaked, sheared, weaved, cleaved, abided, seethed. 4. Give, bid, sit, make in the preterite gave, bade, sate. In the participle passive given, bidden, sitten. But in both, bid. 5. Draw, know, grow, throw, blow, crow, like a cock, fly, slay, see, lie. Make their preterite drew, knew, grew, threw, blew, crew, flew, slew, saw, lay. Their participles passive by n, drawn, known, grown, thrown, blown, flown, slain, seen, lean, lain. Yet from flee is made fled, from go, went, from the old wend. The participle is gone. End of Part 2 of A Grammar of the English Language by Samuel Johnson Read by Bill Borst Part Three of A Grammar of the English Tongue by Samuel Johnson. Read for the LibriVox Language Learning Collection, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Of Derivation That the English language may be more easily understood, it is necessary to inquire how its derivative words are deduced from their primitives, and how the primitives are borrowed from other languages. In this inquiry, I shall sometimes copy Dr. Wallace, and sometimes endeavor to supply his detects and rectify his errors. Nouns are derived from verbs. The thing implied in the verb, as done or produced, is commonly either the present of the verb, as to love, love, to fright, a fright, to fight, a fight, or the preterite of the verb, as to strike, I strick, or struck, a stroke. The action is the same with the participle present, as loving, frighting, fighting, striking. The agent, or person acting, is denoted by the syllable er added to the verb, as lover, frighter, striker. Substantives, adjectives, and sometimes other parts of speech are changed into verbs, in which case the vowel is often lengthened, or the consonant softened, as a house, to house, brass, to braise, glass, to glaze, grass, to graze, price, to prize, breath, to breathe, a fish, to fish, oil, to oil, further, to further, forward, to forward, hinder, to hinder. Sometimes the termination en is added, especially to adjectives, as haste, to hasten, length, to lengthen, strength, to strengthen, short, to shorten, fast, to fasten, white, to whiten, black, to blacken, hard, to harden, soft, to soften. From substantives are formed adjectives of plenty, by adding the termination y, as a louse, lousy, wealth, wealthy, health, healthy, might, mighty, worth, worthy, wit, witty, lust, lusty, water, watery, earth, earthy, wood, a wood, woody, air, airy, a heart, hearty, a hand, handy. From substantives are formed adjectives of plenty by adding the termination f-u-l, denoting abundance, as joy, joyful, fruit, fruitful, youth, youthful. 
care, careful, use, useful, delight, delightful, plenty, plentiful, help, helpful. Sometimes, in almost the same sense, but with some kind of diminution thereof, the termination SOME is added, denoting something, or in some degree, as delight, delightsome, game, gamesome, irk, irksome, burden, burdensome, trouble, troublesome, light, lightsome, hand, handsome, alone, lonesome, toil, toilsome. On the contrary, the termination LESS added to substantives makes adjectives signifying want as worthless, witless, heartless, joyless, careless, helpless, thus comfort, comfortless, sap, sapless. Privation, or contrariety, is very often denoted by the participle un prefixed to many adjectives, or in before words derived from the Latin, as pleasant, unpleasant, wise, unwise, profitable, unprofitable, patient, impatient. Thus unworthy, unhealthy, unfruitful, unuseful, and many more. The original English privative is un. But as we often borrow from the Latin, or its descendants, words already signifying privation, as inefficacious, impious, indiscreet, the inseparable particles un and in have fallen into confusion, from which it is not easy to disentangle them. Un is prefixed to all words originally English, as untrue, untruth, untaught, unhandsome. Un is prefixed to all participles made privative adjectives as unfeeling, unassisting, unaided, undelighted, unendeared. UN ought never to be prefixed to a participle present to mark a forbearance of action as unsighing, but a privation of habit as unpitying. UN is prefixed to most substantives which have an English termination as unfertileness, unperfectness, which, if they have borrowed terminations, take IN or IM as infertility, imperfection, uncivil, incivility, unactive, inactivity. In borrowing adjectives, if we receive them already compounded, it is usual to retain the particle prefixed as indecent inelegant, improper. But if we borrow the adjective and add the privative particle, we commonly prefix un as unpolite, ungallant. The prepositive particles dis and mis, derived from the des and mes of the French, signify almost the same as un. Yet dis rather imports contrariety than privation, since it answers to the Latin preposition de. MIS insinuates some error, and for the most part may be rendered by the Latin words male or perperan, to like, to dislike, honor, dishonor, to honor, to grace, to dishonor, to disgrace, to deign, to disdain, chance, hap, mischance, mishap, to take, to mistake, deed, misdeed, to use, to misuse, to employ, to misemploy, to apply, to misapply. Words derived from Latin written with de or dis retain the same signification as distinguish, distinguo, detract, detraho, defame, defamo, detain, detinao. The termination ly added to substantives and sometimes to adjectives forms adjectives that import some kind of similitude or agreement, being formed by contraction of L-I-C-K, or L-I-K-E, a giant, giantly, giant-like, earth, earthly, heaven, heavenly, world, worldly, God, 
godly, good, goodly. The same termination ly added to adjectives forms adverbs of like signification as beautiful beautifully, sweet sweetly, that is, in a beautiful manner, with some degree of sweetness. The termination ish added to adjectives imports diminution, and added to substantives imports similitude or tendency to a character, as green, greenish, white, whitish, soft, softish, a thief, thievish, a wolf, wolfish, a child, childish. We have forms of diminutives in substantives, though not frequent, as a hill, a hillock, a cock, a cockerel, a pike, a pickerel. This is a French termination. A goose, a gosling. This is a German termination. A lamb, a lambkin. A chick, a chicken. A man, a mannequin. A pipe, a pipkin. And thus Halkin, whence the patronymic Hawkins, Wilkin, Tomkin, and others. Yet still there is another form of diminution among the English, by lessening the sound itself, especially of vowels, as there is a form of augmenting them by enlarging or even lengthening it, and that sometimes not so much by change of the letters, as of their pronunciation, as sup, sip, soup, sop, sip it, where, besides the extenuation of the vowel, there is added the French termination et top, tip, spit, spout, babe, baby, booby, Greek, boupes. Great pronounced long, especially if with a st stronger sound, great. Little pronounced long, little. Ting, tang, tong, imports a succession of smaller and then greater sounds, and so in jingle, jangle, tingle, tangle, and many other made words. Much, however, of this is arbitrary and fanciful, depending wholly on oral utterance, and therefore scarcely worthy the notice of Wallace. Of concrete adjectives are made abstract substantives. By adding the termination N-E-S-S, and a few in H-O-O-D, or H-E-A-D, noting character or qualities, as white, whiteness, hard, hardness, great, greatness, skillful, skillfulness, unskillfulness, godhead, manhood, maidenhead, widowhood, knighthood, priesthood, likelihood, falsehood. There are other abstracts, partly derived from adjectives, and partly from verbs, which are formed by the addition of the termination th a small change being sometimes made, as long, length, strong, strength, broad, breadth, wide, width, deep, depth, true, truth, warm, warmth, dear, dearth, slow, sloth, merry, mirth, heel, health, well, wheel, wealth, dry, drought, young, youth, and so moon, month. Like these are some words derived from verbs, die, death, till, tilth, grow, growth, mow, later, moth, after moth. Commonly spoken and written later, math after math, steel, stealth, bear, birth, Rue, Ruth, and probably earth from to ear or plough. Fly, flight, weigh, wait, fray, fright, draw, draught. These should rather be written flyth, frith, only that custom will not suffer H to be twice repeated. The same form retain faith, spite, Wreathe, wrath, broth, froth, breath, sooth, worth, 
light, white, and the like, whose primitives are either entirely obsolete or seldom occur. Perhaps they are derived from fay or foy, spry, rye, reek, brew, mo, fry, bray, say, work. Some ending in ship imply an office, employment, or condition, as kingship, wardship, guardianship, partnership, stewardship, headship, lordship. Thus worship, that is, worth, ship, whence worshipful, and to worship. Some few ending in d-o-m, r-i-c-k, w-i-c-k, do especially denote dominion, at least state or condition, as kingdom, dukedom, earldom, princedom, popedom, christendom, freedom, wisdom, whoredom, bishopric, bailiwick. M-E-N-T and A-G-E are plainly French terminations, and are of the same import with us as among them, scarcely ever occurring, except in words derived from the French, as commandment, usage. There are in English often long trains of words allied by their meaning and derivation, as to beat, a bat, batoon, a battle, a beetle, a battledore, to batter, batter, a kind of glutinous composition for food, made by beating different bodies into one mass. All these are of similar signification, and perhaps derived from the Latin batuo. Thus take, touch, tickle, tack, tackle, all imply a local conjunction from the Latin tango, tetigi, tactum. From two are formed twain, twice, twenty, twelve, twins, twine, twist, twirl, twig, twitch, twinge, between, betwixt, twilight, twibble. The following remarks, extracted from Wallace, are ingenious but of more subtlety than solidity, and such as perhaps might in every language be enlarged without end. S.N. usually imply the nose, and what relates to it. From the Latin nasus are derived the French ne and the English nose, and ness, a promontory as projecting like a nose. But as if from the consonants ns taken from nasus, and transposed that they may the better correspond, S.N. denote nasus and thence are derived many words that relate to the nose, as snout, sneeze, snore, snort, sneer, snicker, snot, snivel, snite, snuff, snuffle, snaffle, snarl, snudge. There is another sn which may perhaps be derived from the Latin sinuo, as snake, sneak, snail, snare, so likewise snap and snatch, snib, snub. B. L. imply a blast, as blow, blast, to blast, to blight, and metaphorically to blast one's reputation. Bleat, bleak, a bleak place, to look bleak, or weather-beaten. Black, blay, bleach, bluster, blurt, blister, blab, bladder, blue, blabber-lipped, blubber-cheeked, bloated, bloat-herrings. Blast, blaze, to blow, that is, blossom, bloom, and perhaps blood and blush. In the native words of our tongue is to be found a great agreement between the letters and the thing signified, and therefore the sounds of the letters smaller, sharper, louder, closer, softer, stronger, clearer, more obscure, and more stridulous do very often intimate the like effects in things signified. Thus words that begin with str intimate the force and effect of the thing signified, as if probably derived from Greek stranimi, or strenuous, as strong, strength, strew, strike, streak, stroke, stripe, strive, strife, struggle, 
strout, strut, stretch, straight, strict, straight, that is narrow, distrain, stress, distress, string, strap, stream, streamer, strand, strip, stray, struggle, strange, stride, straddle. ST in like manner implies strength, but in a less degree so much only as is sufficient to preserve what has been already communicated, rather than acquire any new degree, as if it were derived from the Latin sto. For example, stand, stay, that is, to remain, or to prop, staff, stay, that is, to oppose, stop, to stuff, stifle, to stay, that is, to stop, a stay, that is, an obstacle, stick, stut, stutter, stammer, stagger, stickle, stick, stake, a sharp pail, and anything deposited at play, stock, stem, sting, to sting, stink, stitch, stud, stuncheon, stub, stubble, to stub up, stump, whence, stumble, stalk, to stalk, step, to stamp with the feet, whence to stamp, that is, to make an impression and a stamp, stow, to stow, to be stow, steward, or stoward, stead, steady, steadfast, stable, a stable, a stall, to stall, stool, stall, still, stall, stallage, stage, still, adjective, and still adverb, stale, stout, sturdy, stead, stoat, stallion, stiff, stark dead, to starve with hunger or cold, stone, steel, stern, stanch, to stanch blood, to stare, steep, steeple, stare, standard, a stated measure, stately. In all these, and perhaps some others, st denotes something firm and fixed. THR imply a more violent degree of motion, as throw, thrust, throng, throb, through, threat, threaten, thrall, throws. WR imply some sort of obliquity, or distortion, as wry, to wreathe, to rest, wrestle, ring, wrong, wrench, wrench, wrangle, wrinkle, wrath, reek, rack, wretch, wrist, wrap. SW imply a silent agitation, or a softer kind of lateral motion, as sway, swag, to sway, swagger, swerve, sweat, sweep, swill, swim, swing, swift, sweet, switch, swinge. Nor is there much difference of S.M. in smooth, smug, smile, smirk, smite, which signifies the same as to strike, but is a softer word, small, smell, smack, smother, smart. A smart blow properly signifies such a kind of stroke as with an originally silent motion, implied in S.M proceeds to a quick violence denoted by a r suddenly ended as is shown by t c l denote a kind of adhesion or tenacity as in cleave clay cling climb clamor clammy clasp to clasp to clip to clinch cloak clog close to close a clod a clot as a clot of blood clouted cream, a clutter, a cluster. S.P. imply a kind of dissipation or expansion, especially a quick one, particularly if there be an R, as if it were from Spargo or Separo. For example, spread, spring, sprig, sprout, sprinkle, split, splinter, spill, spit, sputter, spatter. S.L. denote a kind of silent fall, or a less observable motion, as in slime, slide, slip, 
slipper, sly, slate, slit, slow, slack, slight, sling, slap. And so likewise A-S-H in crash, rash, gash, flash, clash, lash, slash, plash, trash, indicate something acting more nimbly and sharply. But U-S-H in crush, rush, gush, flush, blush, brush, hush, push, implies something as acting more obtusely and dully. Yet in both there is indicated a swift and sudden motion not instantaneous, but gradual, by the continued sound sh. Thus in fling, sling, ding, swing, cling, sing, ring, sting, the tingling of the termination ng and the sharpness of the vowel i imply the continuation of a very slender motion or tremor, at length indeed vanishing, but not suddenly interrupted. But in tink, wink, sink, clink, chink, think, that end in a mute consonant, there is also indicated a sudden ending. End of Part 3 of A Grammar of the English Tongue by Samuel Johnson Read by Bill Borst Part 4 of A Grammar of the English Tongue by Samuel Johnson Read for the LibriVox Language Learning Collection, Volume 1 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. If there be an L, as in jingle, tingle, tinkle, mingle, sprinkle, twinkle, there is implied a frequency or iteration of small acts, and the same frequency of acts, but less subtle by reason of the clearer vowel A, is indicated in jangle, tangle, spangle, mangle, wrangle, brangle, dangle, as also in mumble, grumble, jumble. But at the same time the close U implies something obscure or obtunded, and a congeries of consonants, MBL, denotes a confused kind of rolling or tumbling, as in ramble, scamble, scramble, womble, amble. But in these there is something acute. In nimble, the acuteness of the vowel denotes celerity. In sparkle, SP denotes dissipation or an acute crackling, K a sudden interruption, L a frequent iteration. And in like manner, in sprinkle, unless I n may imply the subtlety of the dissipated guttules. Thick and thin differ in that the former ends with an obtuse consonant, and the latter with an acute. In like manner, in squeak, squeak, squeal, squall, brawl, rawl, yawl, spall, screek, shriek, shrill, sharp, shrivel, wrinkle, crack, crash, clash, gnash, plash, crush, hush, hiss, fiss, whist, soft, jar, hurl, curl, whirl, buzz, bustle, spindle, dwindle, twine, twist, and in many more we may observe the agreement of such sort of sounds with the thing signified. And this so frequently happens, that scarce any language which I know can be compared with ours, so that one monosyllable word, of which kind are almost all ours, emphatically expresses what in other languages can scarce be explained but by compounds, or decompounds, or sometimes a tedious circumlocution. We have many words borrowed from the Latin, but the greatest part of them were communicated by the intervention of the French, as grace, face, elegant, elegance, resemble. Some verbs which seem borrowed from the Latin are formed from the present tense, and some from the supines. From the present are formed spend, expend, expendo, conduce, conduso, despise, dispicio, approve, 
approbo, conceive concipio. From the supines, supplicate, supplico, demonstrate, demonstro, dispose, dispono, expatiate, expatior, suppress, supremo, exempt, eximo. Nothing is more apparent than that Wallace goes too far in quest of originals. Many of these, which seem selected as immediate descendants from the Latin, are apparently French, as conceive, approve, expose, exempt. Some words purely French, not derived from the Latin, we have transferred into our language, as garden, garter, buckler, to advance, to cry, to plead, from the French jardin, jartier, bousselier, avancé, crier, plaidé, though indeed even of these part is of Latin original. As to many words which we have in common with the Germans, it is doubtful whether the old Teutons borrowed them from the Latins, or the Latins from the Teutons, or both had them from some common original, as wine, venom, wind, ventus, went, veni, way, via, wall, vallum, wallow, volvo, wool, vellus, will, volo, worm, vermis, worth, virtus, wasp, vespa, de, dies, draw, traho, tame, domo, greek, dameo, yoke, jugum, greek, zugos, over, upper, super, greek, hyper, am, sum, greek, imi, break, frango, fly, volo, blow, flow. I make no doubt but the Teutonic is more ancient than the Latin, and it is no less certain that the Latin, which borrowed a great number of words not only from the Greek, especially the Aeolic, but other neighboring languages, as the Oscan and others, which have long become obsolete, received not a few from the Teutonic. It is certain that the English, German, and other Teutonic languages retained some derived from the Greek, which the Latin has not, as ax, ox, mit, ford, ferd, daughter, tocter, mickle, mingle, moon, seer, oar, grave, graph, to grave, to scrape, whole, from, Greek, asini, Greek, meta, Greek, porthmos, Greek, thigator, Greek, megalos, Greek, mignio, Greek, mene, Greek, zeros, Greek, grapho, Greek, holos. Since they received these immediately from the Greeks, without the intervention of the Latin language, why may not other words be derived immediately from the same fountain, though they be likewise found among the Latins? Our ancestors were studious to form borrowed words, however long, into monosyllables, and not only cut off the formative terminations, but cropped the first syllable, especially in words beginning with a vowel, and rejected not only vowels in the middle, but likewise consonants of a weaker sound, retaining the stronger, which seem the bones of words, or changing them for others of the same organ, in order that the sound might become the softer but especially transposing their order, that they might the more readily be pronounced without the intermediate vowels. For example, in expendo, spend, exemplum, sample, excipio, scape, extraneous, strange, extractum, stretched, excrucio, to screw, excorio, to scour, excorio, to scourge, excortico to scratch, and others beginning with X, as also emendo to mend, episcopus, bishop, in Danish bisp, epistola, epistle, hospitale, spittle, hispania, Spain, historia, story. Many of these etymologies are doubtful, 
and some are evidently mistaken. The following are somewhat harder. Alexander, Sander, Elizabetha, Betty, Apis, B, Aper, Bar, P passing into B as in Bishop, and by cutting off A from the beginning, which is restored in the middle. But for the old bar or bear, we now say bore. As for lang, long, for bane, bane, for stain, stone, aprugna, brawn, p being changed into b, and a transposed, as in upper, and g changed into w, as in pignus, pawn, lege, law, Greek, alopex, fox, cutting off the beginning, and changing p into f, as in pellus, a fell, pullus, a foal, pater, father, pavor, fear, polio, file, pleo, impleo, fill, full, piscus, fish, and transposing o into the middle, which was taken from the beginning, apex, a piece, peak, pike, zaphorus, frees, mustum, stum, defensio, fence, dispensator, spencer, asculto, escute, French, scout, excalpo, scrape, restoring L instead of R, and hence scrap, scrabble, scrawl, exculpo, scoop, exteritus, start, extonitus, atonitus, stand, stomachus, maw, offendo, find, obstipo, stop, audere, dare, caver, where, whence aware, beware, wary, warn, warning. For the Latin V consonant formerly sounded like our W, and the modern sound of the V consonant was formerly that of the letter F, that is, the aeolic digamma, which had the sound of Greek PH, and the modern sound of the letter F was that of the Greek, Greek PH, or PH. Ulsus, ulcer, ulcer, sore, and hence sorry, soro, sorrowful, ingenium, engine, gin, scalinus, leaning, unless you would rather derive it from Greek, clino, whence inclino, infundibulum, funnel, gagates, jet, projectum, to jet forth, a jetty, cuculus, a cowl. There are syncopes somewhat harder, from tempore, time, from nomine, name, domina, dame, as the French homme, femme, nom, from omine, fomina, nomine, thus pagina, page, Greek proterion, pot, Greek, cipella, cup, cantharus, can, tentorium, tent, precor, prey, preda, prey, specio, speculor, spy, plico, ply, implico, imply, replico, reply, complico, comply, Sedis Episcopalis, C. A vowel is also cut off in the middle, that the number of the syllables may be lessened, as amita, ant, spiritus, sprite, debitum, debt, dubito, doubt, comus, comitus, count, clericus, clerk, quietus, quit, quite, acquieto, to acquit, separo, to spare, stabilis, stable, stabulum, stable, palacium, palace, place, rabula, rail, rawl, rawl, brawl, rabble, brabble, 
Kiseto Quest. As also a consonant, or at least one of a softer sound, or even a whole syllable, rotundus round, fragilis frail, securus sure, regula rule, tegula tile, subtilus subtle, nomen noun, decanus dean, computo count, subitaneous sudden, soon superare to soar periculum peril mirabile marvel as magnus main dignor dane tingo stain tinctum taint pingo paint predare reach the contractions may seem harder where many of them meet as greek kyriakos kirk church Presbyter, priest, sacristanus, sexton, frango, fragi, break, breach, phagus, Greek, phaga, beach, f changed into b, and g into ch, which are letters near akin, fregesco, freeze, fregesco, fresh, sc into sh, as above in bishop, fish, so in scaffa, skiff, skip, and refrigesco refresh but viresco fresh phlebotomus phleme bovina beef vitulina veal scutifer squire ponitentia penance sanctuarium sanctuary sentry casitio chase perquistio purchase anguilla Eel, insula, isle, isle, island, island, insuleta, islet, islet, ite, and more contractedly, ey, whence ounsi, ruli, eli. Examinare, to scan, namely by rejecting from the beginning and end e and o according to the usual manner. The remainder, examine which the Saxons, who did not use X, writ C-S-A-M-E-N, or S-C-A-M-E-N, is contracted into scan, as from Dominus, Don, Nomine, Noun, Abomino, Ban, and indeed Apum, Examen. They turned into S-C-I-A-M-E, for which we say swarm, by inserting R to denote the murmuring thesaurus store sedile stool greek aetos wet pseudo sweat gaudium gay jacus joy sucus juice catena chain caliga calga shows shows french hose extinguo stand squench quench stint Forus, fourth, species, spice, recito, read, adjuvo, aid, Greek, aeon, avum, I, age, ever, flaccus, lock, excerpo, scrape, scrabble, scrawl, extravagus, stray, straggle, collectum, clot, clutch, coligo, Coil, recaligo, recoil, severo, swear, stridulous, shrill, procurator, proxy, pulso, to push, calamus, a quill, impeter, to impeach, agio, oxy, wax, and venesco, venui, wane, syllabary, to spell, puteus, pit, granum, corn, comprimo, cramp, crump, crumple, crinkle. Some may seem harsher, yet may not be rejected, for it at least appears that some of them are derived from proper names, and there are others whose etymology is acknowledged by everybody, as Alexander, 
Elick, Scander, Sander, Sandy, Sanny, Elizabetha, Elizabeth, Elizabeth, Betty, Bess, Margarita, Margaret, Margaret, Meg, Peg, Maria, Mary, Mal, Paul, Malkin, Mawkin, Mox, Matthias, Matha, Matthew, Martha, Matt, Pat, Gulielmus, Wilhelmus, Gerolamo, Guillaume, William, Will, Bill, Wilkin, Wiccan, Wicks, Weeks, Thus Cariophilus, Floss, Girofalo, Italian, Girifli, Gillofer, French, Gilliflower, which the vulgar call July flower, as if derived from the month July. Petrocelinum, Parsley, Portulaca, Purslane. Sidonium, Quince, Sidoniatum, Quiddenly, Persicum, Peach, Eruca, Eruc, which they corrupt to earwig as if it took its name from the ear. Annulus geminus, a jimmel, or jimble ring, and thus the word jimble or jumble is transferred to other things thus interwoven. Calcachos, kickshaws. Since the origin of these, and many others, however forced, is evident, it ought to appear no wonder to any one if the ancients have thus disfigured many, especially as they so much affected monosyllables, and to make the sound the softer, took this liberty of maiming, taking away, changing, transposing, and softening them. But while we derive these from the Latin, I do not mean to say that many of them did not immediately come to us from the Saxon, Danish, Dutch, and Teutonic languages, and other dialects, and some taken more lately from the French or Italians, or Spaniards. The same word, according to its different significations, often has a different origin, as to bear a burden, from Firo, but to bear, whence birth, born, bairn, comes from pario, and a bear, at least if it be of Latin original, from Fera. Thus perch, a fish, from perca, but perch, a measure, from pertica, and likewise to perch. To spell is from syllaba, but spell, an enchantment, by which it is believed that the boundaries are so fixed in lands that none can pass them against the master's will, from expello, and spell, a messenger, from epistola. Whence gospel, good spell, or god spell. Thus frise, or frise, from frigesco, but frise, an architectonic word, from zaphorus, but frise, for cloth, from phrygia, or perhaps from frigesco, as being more fit than any other for keeping out the cold. There are many words among us, even monosyllables, compounded of two or more words, at least serving instead of compounds, and comprising the signification of more words than one, as from scrip and roll comes scroll, from proud and dance prance, from st of the verb stay or stand and out is made stout, from stout and hardy, sturdy, from sp of spit or spew, and out comes spout, from the same sp with the termination in is spin, and adding out, spin out, and from the same sp with it is spit, which only differs from spout in that it is smaller, and with less noise and force. But sputter is, because of the obscure u, something between spit and spout, and by reason of adding r it intimates a frequent iteration and noise, but obscurely confused, whereas spatter, on account of the sharper and clearer vowel a, intimates a more distinct poise, in which it chiefly differs from sputter. From the same sp and the termination arc comes spark, signifying a single emission of fire with a noise, namely sp, the emission, ar, the more acute noise, and k, the mute consonant, intimates its being suddenly terminated. 
but adding l is made the frequentative sparkle the same sp by adding r that is spr implies a more lively impetus of diffusing or expanding itself to which adding the termination ing it becomes spring its vigor spr imports its sharpness the termination ing and lastly in acute and tremulous ending in the mute consonant g denotes the sudden ending of any motion that it is meant in its primary signification of a single, not a complicated, exhalition. Hence, we call spring whatever has an elastic force, as also a fountain of water, and thence the origin of any thing. And to spring, to germinate, and spring, one of the four seasons. From the same SPR and out is formed sprout, and with the termination IG, sprig, of which the following for the most part, is the difference. Sprout, of a grosser sound, imports a fatter or grosser bud. Sprig, of a slenderer sound, denotes a smaller shoot. In like manner, from str of the verb strive and out, comes strout and strut. From the same str, and the termination ugle, is made struggle, and this gl imports, but without any great noise, by reason of the obscure sound, of the vowel u. In like manner, from throw and roll is made troll, and almost in the same sense is trundle, from throw or thrust and rundle. Thus graff or groff is compounded of grave and rough, and trudge from tread or trot and drudge. In these observations it is easy to discover great sagacity and great extravagance, an ability to do much defeated by the desire of doing more than enough. It may be remarked, one, that Wallace's derivations are often so made, that by the same license any language may be deduced from any other. Two, that he makes no distinction between words immediately derived by us from the Latin and those which, being copied from other languages, can therefore afford no example of the genius of the English language, or its laws of derivation. 3. That he derives from the Latin, often with great harshness and violence, words apparently Teutonic, and therefore, according to his own declaration, probably older than the tongue to which he refers them. 4. That some of his derivations are apparently erroneous. Syntax. The established practice of grammarians requires that I should here treat of the syntax, but our language has so little inflection or variety of terminations that its construction neither requires nor admits many rules. Wallace, therefore, has totally neglected it. And Johnson, whose desire of following the writers upon the learned languages made him think a syntax indispensably necessary, has published such petty observations as were better omitted. The verb, as in other languages, agrees with the nominative in number and person, as thou fliest from good, he runs to death. Our adjectives and pronouns are invariable. Of two substantives, the noun possessive is in the genitive, as his father's glory, the sun's heat. Verbs transitive require an oblique case, as he loves me, you fear him. All prepositions require an oblique case, as he gave this to me, he took this from me, he says this of me, he came with me. Prosody. It is common for those that deliver the grammar of modern languages to omit the prosody, so that of the Italians is neglected by Buometai, that of the French by De Marais, and that of the English by Wallace, Cooper, and even by Johnson, though a poet. But as the laws of meter are included in the idea of grammar, I have thought proper to insert them. Prosody comprises orthoepy, or the rules of pronunciation, and orthometry, or the laws of versification. Pronunciation is just, 
when every letter has its proper sound, and every syllable has its proper accent, or, which in English versification is the same, its proper quantity. The sounds of the letters have been already explained, and rules for the accent or quantity are not easily to be given, being subject to innumerable exceptions. Such, however, as I have read or formed, I shall here propose. 1. Of dissyllables, formed by affixing a termination, the former syllable is commonly accented as childish, kingdom, actus, acted, toilsome, lover, scoffer, fairer, foremost, zealous, fullness, godly, meekly, artist. 2. Dissyllables formed by prefixing a syllable to the radical word have commonly the accent on the latter, as to beget, to be seem, to bestow. 3. Of dissyllables, which are at once nouns and verbs, the verb has commonly the accent on the latter, and the noun on the former syllable, as to descant, a descant, to cement a cement, to contract, a contract. This rule has many exceptions. Though verbs seldom have their accent on the former, yet nouns often have it on the latter syllable, as delight, perfume. 4. All dissyllables ending in y as cranny, in our as labor, favor, in ow as willow, wallow, except allow, in le as battle bible in ish as banish in ck as cambric cassock in ter as to batter in age as courage in en as fasten in et as quiet accent the former syllable 5 dissyllable nouns in er as canker butter have the accent on the former syllable. 6. Dissyllable verbs terminating in a consonant and e final, as comprise, escape, or having a diphthong in the last syllable, as appease, reveal, or ending in two consonants, as attend, have the accent on the latter syllable. 7. Dissyllable nouns having a diphthong in the latter syllable, have commonly their accent on the latter syllable, as applause, except words in a-i-n, certain, mountain. 8. Trisyllables, formed by adding a termination or prefixing a syllable, retain the accent of the radical word, as loveliness, tenderness, contemner, wagoner, physical, bespatter, commenting, commending, assurance. 9. Trisyllables, ending in O-U-S, as gracious, arduous, in A-L, as capital, in I-O-N, as mention, accent the first. 10. Trisyllables, ending in C-E, E-N-T, and A-T-E, accent the first syllable, as countenance, continence, armament, imminent, elegant, propagate, except they be derived from words having the accent on the last, as connivance, acquaintance, or the middle syllable hath a vowel before two consonants, as promulgate. 11. Trisyllables ending in Y, as entity, specify, liberty, victory, subsidy, commonly accent the first syllable. 12. Trisyllables in re or le accent the first syllable as legible theater except disciple and some words which have a position as example epistle 13 trisyllables in ude commonly accent the first syllable as plenitude 14 trisyllables ending in ator or atour as creator, or having in the middle syllable a diphthong as endeavor, or a vowel before two consonants as domestic, 
accent the middle syllable. 15. Trisyllables that have their accent on the last syllable are commonly French, as acquiesce, reparte, magazine, or words formed by prefixing one or two syllables to an acute syllable, as immature, overcharge. 16. Polysyllables, or words of more than three syllables, follow the accent of the words from which they are derived, as arrogating, continency, incontinently, commendable, communicableness. We should therefore say disputable, indisputable, rather than disputable, indisputable, and advertisement, rather than advertisement. 17. Words in ION have the accent upon the antepenult, as salvation, perturbation, concoction. Words in ATOUR or ATOR on the penult, as dedicator. 18. Words ending in LE commonly have the accent on the first syllable, as amicable, unless the second syllable have a vowel before two consonants, as combustible. 19. Words ending in OUS have the accents on the antipenult, as uxorious, voluptuous. 20. Words ending in TY have their accent on the antipenult, as pusillanimity activity. These rules are not advanced as complete or infallible, but proposed as useful. Almost every rule of every language has its exceptions, and in English, as in other tongues, much must be learned by example and authority. Perhaps more and better rules may be given that have escaped my observation. Versification is the arrangement of a certain number of syllables according to certain laws. The feet of our verses are either iambic, as aloft, create, or trochaic, as holy, lofty. Our iambic measure comprises verses of four syllables. Most good, most fair, or things as rare, to call use lost. For all the cost words can bestow, so poorly show upon your praise, that all the ways since hath come short. Drayton. With ravished ears the monarch hears. Dryden. Of six. This while we are abroad, shall we not touch our lyre? Shall we not sing an ode? Or shall that holy fire in us that strongly glowed in this cold air expire though in the utmost peak a while we do remain amongst the mountains bleak exposed to sleet and rain no sport our hours shall break to exercise our vein what though bright phoebus beams refresh the southern ground and though the princely thames with beauteous nymphs abound, and by old Camber's streams be many wonders found. Yet many rivers clear here glide in silver swaths, and what of all most dear, Buxton's delicious baths, strong ale and noble cheer, to swage bream winter's scathes. In places far or near, or famous or obscure, Where wholesome is the air, or where the most impure, All times and everywhere, the muse is still in Ur. Drayton Of eight, which is the usual measure for short poems, And may at last my weary age find out the peaceful hermitage, the hairy gown and mossy cell where i may sit and nightly spell of every star the sky doth shew and every herb that sips the dew milton of ten which is the common measure of 
heroic and tragic poetry full in the midst of this created space betwixt heaven and earth and skies there stands a place confining on all three with triple bound whence all things though remote are viewed around and thither bring their undulating sound the palace of loud fame her seat of power placed on the summit of a lofty tower a thousand winding entries long and wide receive of fresh reports a flowing tide a thousand crannies in the walls are made nor gate nor bars exclude the busy trade tis built of brass the better to diffuse the spreading sounds and multiply the news where echoes in repeated echoes play a mart for ever full and open night and day nor silence is within nor voice express but a deaf noise of sounds that never cease confused and chiding like the hollow roar of tides receding from the insulted shore or like the broken thunder heard from far when jove to distance drives the rolling war the courts are filled with a tumultuous din of crowds or issuing forth or entering in a thoroughfare of news where some devise things never heard some mingle truth with lies the troubled air with empty sounds they beat intent to hear and eager to repeat dryden in all these measures the accents are to be placed on even syllables and every line considered by itself is more harmonious as this rule is more strictly observed the variations necessary to pleasure belong to the art of poetry, not the rules of grammar. Our trochaic measures are of three syllables. Here we may think and pray, before death stops our breath. Other joys are but toys. Walton's Angler Of Five in the days of old stories plainly told lovers felt annoy old ballad of seven fairest piece of well-formed earth urge not thus your haughty birth waller in these measures the accent is to be placed on the odd syllables these are the measures which are now in use, and above the rest those of seven, eight, and ten syllables. Our ancient poets wrote verses sometimes of twelve syllables, as Drayton's Polyalbion. Of all the Cambrian shires their heads that bear so high, and farthest survey their soils with an ambitious eye, Mervinia for her hills, as for their matchless crowds, the nearest that are said to kiss the wandering clouds a special audience craves offended with the throng that she of all the rest neglected was so long alleging for herself when through the saxons pride the godlike race of brute to severn's setting side were cruelly enforced her mountains did relieve those whom devouring war else everywhere did grieve and when all wails beside by fortune or by might unto her ancient foe resigned her ancient right a constant maiden still she only did remain the last her genuine laws which stoutly did retain and as each one is praised for her peculiar things so only she is rich in mountains meres and springs and holds herself as great in her superfluous waste as others by their towns and fruitful tillage graced and of fourteen as chapman's homer and as the mind of such a man that hath a long way gone and either knoweth not his way or else would let alone his purposed journey is distract the measures of twelve and fourteen syllables were often mingled by our old poets sometimes in alternate lines and sometimes in alternate couplets the verse of twelve syllables called an alexandrine is now only used to diversify heroic lines 
Walker was smooth, but Dryden taught to join the varying verse, the full resounding line, the long majestic march, and energy divine. Pope The pause in the Alexandrine must be at the sixth syllable. The verse of fourteen syllables is now broken into a soft lyric measure of verses, consisting alternately of eight syllables and six. She to receive thy radiant name selects a whiter space. Fenton When all shall praise and every lay devote a wreath to thee, that day, for come it will, that day shall I lament to see. Lewis to Pope Beneath this tomb an infant lies to earth whose body lent, hereafter shall more glorious rise, but not more innocent. When the archangel's trump shall blow, and souls to bodies join, what crowds shall wish their lives below had been as short as thine? Wesley We have another measure very quick and lively, and therefore much used in songs, which may be called the anapestic, in which the accent rests upon every third syllable. May I govern my passions with absolute sway, and grow wiser and better as life wears away. Dr. Pope In this measure a syllable is often retrenched from the first foot, as Diogenes surly and proud. Dr. Pope When present we love, and when absent agree, I think not of Iris nor Iris of me. Dryden these measures are varied by many combinations, and sometimes by double endings, either with or without rhyme, as in the heroic measure. Tis the divinity that stirs within us, tis heaven itself that points out an hereafter, and intimates eternity to man. Addison So in that of eight syllables, they neither added nor confounded, they neither wanted nor abounded. Prior in that of seven, for resistance I could fear none, but with twenty ships had done, what thou brave and happy Vernon hast achieved with six alone. Glover. In that of six, twas when the seas were roaring, with hollow blasts of wind, a damsel lay deploring, all on a rock reclined. Gay. In the anapestic, when terrible tempests assail us, and mountainous billows affright, nor power nor wealth can avail us, but skilful industry steers right. Ballad To these measures and their laws may be reduced every species of English verse. Our versification admits of few licenses except a sinalifa, or elision of e in the before a vowel as the eternal, and more rarely of O in two as to accept, and a sinaresis by which two short vowels coalesce into one syllable, as question, special, or a word is contracted by the expulsion of a short vowel before A liquid, as avarice, temperance. Thus have I collected rules and examples by which the English language may be learned, if the reader be already acquainted with grammatical terms, or taught by a master to those that are more ignorant. To have written a grammar for such as are not yet initiated in the schools would have been tedious, and perhaps at last ineffectual. End of Part 4 of a Grammar of the English Tongue by Samuel Johnson. Read by Bill Borst.